Um, yeah, and so if someone is here to uh, be an investigative reporter, we have everything recorded. So don't stretch the truth. Very naughty. We're very careful with our words. Excellent. I'm so grateful all of you can be here. So I'm going to invite up Marty. I'm just going to find him on the chart to make him a co-host. Before Marty comes on, I'll read out an introduction and we'll be ready to go. Marty Moore currently serves as a lawyer with the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms, a legal charity dedicated to defending the constitutional freedoms of Canadians through litigation and education. Thank you very much. <laughs> In his work, Marty regularly defends students, organizations, and ordinary citizens, including those with pro-life views, exercising their fundamental freedoms of conscience, expression, peaceful assembly, and association. Marty represented the Prince Albert Right to Life Association after its application to fly a pro-life flag was denied by the city of Prince Albert. Marty grew up near Tisdale, Saskatchewan, gained a U.S. law degree and practiced in the Chicago area before returning and completing further legal studies at the University of Saskatchewan College of Law. He resides in Calgary and enjoys returning home to Saskatchewan to visit family and friends. Please make a warm welcome for Marty. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis. I appreciate it. And it's a pleasure to be with each of you on this Saturday morning. Although I guess we're uh, into the afternoon just like that. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a privilege, again, always to speak to people in Saskatchewan. I, I definitely feel deep connection there. Um, I still cheer for the Rough Riders in case anyone wanted to know. Um, and so uh, it's, awesome. it's, it's exciting as well uh, that my work with the Justice Center often leads me back into Saskatchewan. Uh, it was a privilege to connect uh, with Val Hetrick, of course, and others in regard to the Prince Albert Right to Life Association. And uh, maybe more relevant or additionally relevant to the topic that we're discussing right now, uh, going to be discussing bubble zones, which uh, we'll get right into. But I've been back in Saskatchewan dealing with a lot of other restrictions on protests. Some of you may have heard about this COVID pandemic in the last couple of years, which evidently led some government officials, including in good old common sense Saskatchewan, to believe that any gathering over 10 persons, at least if it was opposed to government measures, was prohibited. And so I represent in the realm of 100 different people who've been charged 23 or $2,800 for any time they participated in an outdoor protest over 10 people. Um, I recently cross-examined the government experts and they confirmed my suspicions that they couldn't track a single COVID transmission to an outdoor protest. But all that being said is that in Canada, um, we have something called the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And that is what the organization I work for is dedicated to defending. Uh, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, of course, defends Canadians fundamental freedoms, and those are the freedom of conscience and religion, the freedom of thought, opinion, belief, and expression, the freedom of the press and other media, the freedom of peaceful assembly, which is incredibly important when you're talking about outdoor protests, and of course, the freedom of association as well. And so the Justice Center is a legal charity. It uh, does all of its litigation and legal advice pro bono, and it's a privilege to serve in that capacity. And I've been asked to speak about the issue of bubble zones. And these are uh, sometimes called quote unquote safe access zones. Um, essentially what they are, are zones where the government uh, or the courts are prohibiting the peaceful exercise of Canadians' constitutional freedoms. Uh, and I think as, as the slide was just showing there, uh, thank you, Francis. Um, there's a historical context to these bubble zones and uh, the actions in regard to abortion have not always been peaceful. And this is really the context where this comes from. Of course, in 1992, the Morgenthaler Clinic in, in Toronto was firebombed. There had been other threats uttered and made. Uh, I think if you go to 1993, if you want to bump to the next thing there, you, uh, 1994 is the reported case. Um, there was a lot of activity in the realm of abortion clinics. Uh, in Ontario, uh, many people were, were protesting. There was 
harassment. There was allegations of kidnapping uh, where, where people attempting to get to uh, an abortion clinic would, were allegedly being pulled into other buildings, given material, and then only released after that. Uh, there was uh, physical uh, confrontations, obstruction, those kinds of things. And in 1994, uh, a Superior Court in Ontario issued, uh, I believe, the first bubble zone in Canada. Uh, if you look at the data for that, um, it was, uh, again, it was issued by a court on an injunction application. And there, uh, Justice George Adams of the Ontario General Division ordered protesters to stay 20 meters away from abortion clinics and doctor's offices in Toronto, Brantford, Kingston, and 160 meters away from physicians' homes. And uh, anyway, it's interesting to note that injunction actually expired in 2017 and, and a law was replaced and, and with the support actually of uh, an, an individual by the name of Patrick Brown, who's come to recent prominence again, uh, passed a bubble zone imposing a 50 meter access zone. That was in 2017. Um, I'll back up again to BC in 1995, if I can go back that direction, Francis. And in 1995 in, in BC, uh, you have the, the shooting of an abortion doctor in that province. Uh, you have a rash of protests that, that wouldn't necessarily be described as, as simple, simply peaceful assembly. You have uh, individuals chaining doors, you have individuals uh, chasing staff and, and others up and into buildings. Um, there was allegations of other violent and violence and threats. And the BC legislature passed its own bubble zone law. And this law, again, uh, was for the purpose of prohibiting uh, not just violent activity, which of course is prohibited under the under the criminal code, but, but prohibiting even demonstrating uh, outside of abortion clinics. Uh, this came to be a 50 meter zone around abortion clinics and penalties of financial penalties, $2,000 and up to six months in jail could be imposed. And so that's some of the background uh, of this uh, concept of, of bubble zones in Canada around abortion clinics. That was about the situation uh, from a legislative standpoint until more recently, where in 2017, 2016, it looks like they're in Newfoundland, uh, they uh, brought an injunction application. There was a settlement of that for a 40 meter bubble zone. Then the legislature took it up past the 50 meter bubble zone. Again, in 2017, the liberal government with the support of Patrick Brown implemented this 50 meter bubble zone. In 2018, the NDP government instituted a 50 meter bubble zone. And in 2020, uh, I think it should be a 50 meter bubble zone there. I think that's a typo on my part uh, with Nova Scotia. So now we've seen bubble zones enacted across the country in these other places. And I'll just go on to the next slide here as well. In Alberta, you have uh, rather egregious uh, charter violating provisions. And, and you can see there from the text on your screen the, the prohibition on what you can do in a bubble zone in this massive 50 meter area outside of an abortion clinic is, is quite far reaching. Um, they, they use the term interference, but what they're talking about there, and you can see a quote, is even anything informing concerning issues related to abortion service by any means. So, so if there is any expression that you are engaging in, uh, related to abortion services, that's called interference, which is just a complete misnomer. You're not interfering with anyone by expressing uh, information on something. Uh, of course, in a free and democratic society, uh, we expect people to be able to receive information and make their own decisions based on that information. Of course, there's also this, this direct prohibition on engaging in protests. Um, there are more... Um, what would be commonly understood as already prohibited by the criminal code, uh, preventing people from accessing or intimidating patients and physicians, um, which are part of this. So really the most intense aspect of, of these bubble zones is this kind of idea that 
Well, in the, again, in the province of Alberta, currently, you cannot even inform another person about abortion services within a 50 meter zone around an abortion clinic. And so I'll go on to the next slide there, Francis. The punishments are rather severe. Uh, when you think of, of the allegation or the, or the, the act that would, would violate these bubble zones, simply informing someone in relation to abortion, regardless of, of which direction, any information there, uh, obviously applied only to pro-life individuals, uh, people working for the clinic are exempted, um, punishable by $5,000, six months in prison or both, uh, and that's for the first offense, $10,000 or one year in prison for any subsequent offenses. And so the, the seriousness of the penalty being imposed in relation to the very uh, charter protected action, which is simply informing about a particular subject is egregious from a constitutional perspective. And as we'll get into a little bit, the constitutional rights in Canada, they are subject to discretionary limits by the courts, but those limits can only be permitted if they are reasonable and demonstrably justified. Uh, looking now here to a more recent piece of legislation, this is the federal government's addition to the criminal code. Um, this is ostensibly in response to COVID, but I can tell you that uh, it certainly would apply to any other communication surrounding hospitals and clinics. Um, and, and here's the criminal offense. So now we're talking about a crime. We're not talking about a, a regulatory or quasi-regulatory offense. A criminal offense punishable, uh, and I think it, it's a punishable law by 10 years in prison. Every person commits an offense who engages in any conduct with the intent to provoke a state of fear. Now, that's not normally the intent of any, of any individual, but of course, there are some... Uh, the, the, the chilling effect of this particular crime could be, could be severe. Um, in order to impede someone from obtaining health services or to impede uh, a health uh, practitioner in the performance of their duties. And so again, we have another uh, additional layered on uh, prohibition in Canada that could affect expression uh, that is given by those um, surrounding uh, abortion clinics or, or hospitals providing abortions. Um, the laws in Canada are already clear. Harassment has been uh, a crime for a long time, but, but we see a layered on approach here that seems to respond to the political flavors of the moment. And I'll go on to the next, next slide there as well. And uh, you have uh, in uh, the, the crime of obstruction. And, and again, there's a, some vagueness here, intentionally obstructs or interferes. And, and we just looked at that word interference in relation to the bubble zones that exist in Alberta and, and, and other provinces now. Interference being anyone who's providing information, which is an incredibly uh, illogical view of interference. But but should that kind of language be imported into this definition of interference, uh, there is cause for concern from a constitutional level as well. The imprisonment, uh, a term of not more than 10 years. So we're talking about a very serious crime. Um, there is a defense and this would hopefully prove to be successful. I, again, Crime shouldn't be, she, be uh, written in, in such a broad way that, that there's, uh, you have to find exceptions to them in order to prevent constitutional conduct. But, but here we do have an exception which would protect some constitutional conduct um, if you're there for the purpose of obtaining or communicating information uh, that is uh, listed as a defense. And so there, there's some, some concern around the federal criminal law, some obviously opportunity for there to be a defense against charges brought under that, but it's important to recognize that that is part of the context in which these laws are operating. And I'll turn now to Saskatchewan. Maybe you have recognized recently, <laughs> interestingly, at a time when the Saskatchewan government and public health officers have severely limited the right to protest, they also decided to enact a further 
uh, prohibition or, or attempt to enact a further prohibition on uh, protests, and, and that is to import a bubble zone law into Saskatchewan. Um, I, a recent review of the Saskatchewan government website noted that this law is uh, Bill 608. Uh, it's under consideration. I don't know the current status of it, whether it's, it's going to move forward or whether it's not going to move forward. Um, it, the access zone is again 50 meters, uh, extendable up to 150 meters around potential clinics. You can go to the next slide, if you will. So this was the one um, proposed by the NDP, I think, uh, in the summer of or the late spring of 2021 or? Yeah, so what I saw was that it was proposed back then. I believe it was on a different title, a different name. Yeah, uh, yeah. But now uh, it's listed as Bill 608. Uh, okay. I most recently spoke to in December 2020. So it's still on the cards. Like it's not just the bubble zone around hospitals, safe access, but. Yeah, yeah. so this, this law is still sitting at the legislature, the proposal yeah. is. And again, you see, uh, an incredibly broad list of prohibitions. Uh, anyone uh, is prohibited from attempting to advise or persuade a person to refrain from accessing abortion services. Again, here's this incredibly broad language. You're also prohibited from uh, informing or attempting to inform a person concerning issues related to abortion services by any means, including oral, written, or graphic means. And so you couldn't really get any broader than that language in terms of prohibiting the expression of views or just conversation relating to an abortion. And so again, the possibility of this being 50 meters or even 150 meters, an incredibly chilling effect on individuals, uh, not, not simply individuals who are there to uh, express their opposition to abortion, but also individuals who are there to offer services, assistance, counseling, support, uh, whatever uh, an expectant mother may need at that time, any of that would be prohibited. And so you're dealing not here only with the, a potential violation of, of a speaker's right to freedom of expression, but Canada also recognizes the right of individuals to hear, and that is also protected under freedom of expression. And so the, the constitutional rights of women in Saskatchewan to receive information, to receive offers of help, to receive those kinds of things is also violated uh, by this proposal. Um, performing any act of disapproval, so that would be even a silent protest uh, would, be, would be prohibited. Um, if we can go on to the next, there's, there's a number of different prohibitions here. Uh, persistently request that a person refrain from abortion services. Some of this becomes less of, of, a, of a concern constitutionally, although it still has those constitutional violations, but given the breadth of the earlier, uh, the earlier prohibitions, uh, this would almost be included underneath that. Um, here, for, for the purpose of dissuading a person from accessing abortion services, even observing the clinic, uh, physically interfering with, obviously that's that's already a crime if you're interfering with someone's liberty in that fa fashion, uh, or intimidation, that, that would likely be a crime in existing already. Um, go on to the next, the, the final uh, here. And so again, you see very much broad uh, prohibitions uh, at, against photographing, intimidating, physically interfering, or even just repeatedly observing a clinic. And so these kinds of laws are, you know, being pushed in the present day context. And when we go back and we look at, at the context in the early 90s that gave rise to bubble zones in Canada, we're dealing with an incredibly different situation. We're dealing, again, abortion doctors were, were being targeted and shot. Uh, you had sometimes violent and aggressive protests obstructing and blocking and locking the doors on, on clinics. None of that is currently existing anywhere in Canada to any of my knowledge. Um, so what is going on here is not an attempt by 
government to address pressing and, and, and substantial concerns. Rather, what we have is an attempt by ideological opponents to silence those on the opposite side of an issue. That is something that is absolutely unconscionably uh, like the, act, the, the actions of, of government to accede to those kinds of things are unconscionable from a constitutional perspective. And I do want to, to discuss some of the, the contrasts that, that you see uh, in the case law now, um, going back to uh, different cases in Canada. So R.V. Lewis was one of the first cases uh, where a, an individual was protesting outside of an abortion clinic in Vancouver area, I believe, uh, was charged for violating the bubble zone. Uh, Mr. Lewis uh, actually was successful at the initial level of court. Uh, he, he managed to uh, have the, the judge at the provincial court say that the sections of the act were unconstitutional because they barred all forms of, of even peaceful protest. Um, but at the Supreme Court level, Justice Saunders, uh, he referenced this, the shooting of the abortion doctor uh, and, the, and the, of the other shootings in the United States. He referenced the bombing of a clinic in Toronto. He referenced uh, an organization or a, an operation rescue, which was organizing large scale protests and was locking and wiring clinics shut, uh, graffiti, people being uh, targeted for harassment and abuse and in some of these different protests and, and some of the language that was being used around these clinics, uh, murderer, baby killer, those kinds of things. And, and this uh, emotional and emotive facts led uh, Justice Saunders of the BC Supreme Court to to uphold the law and, and the, 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 the surrounding circumstances uh, led Justice Saunders to say the government was justified. He, he noted that you know, people's license plates were being recorded. Uh, there were all sorts of, of condemnation and, and, and abusive and even violent communication uh, being being made so not simply someone speaking forcefully but someone actually grabbing another and physically contacting them and so this led uh, him to uphold that law uh, 2008 court of appeal decision challenging the same law to two men uh, mr watson and mr spratt uh, they were charged with uh, holding signs i believe and and against opposing abortion as well within these 50 meter bubble zones. They lost that case. Mr. Spratt, almost immediately after losing that case, went out again, held up a large sign that said, caution, you can be arrested here under Bill 48 and, quote, be informed this area is BC legislated access, quote unquote, bubble zone, read Bill 48. And for holding up that sign, he was charged with violating the bubble zone law and he lost that case again at the BC Court of Appeal. So this BC Jeez. bubble zone law has been upheld even for people who are simply walking down the street. Um, I would like to look at the other cases there. Um, you're, you're probably familiar with, with some of the, the situations in Ontario. Uh, there's a famous uh, pro-life uh, demonstrator, Ms. Linda Gibbons, I believe. And she has spent, if I'm not mistaken, nearly a dozen years in prison for violating uh, the, the very strict terms of some of these court injunctions. Uh, now, of course, the court injunction has been set aside actually just by due to a procedural rule. Um, and, and then the new bubble zone law came into force, I believe within a very short time period after the bubble zone law came in force, a, a, a priest uh, was charged with violating the bubble zone in Ontario simply for holding a sign uh, similar to the one that Mr. Spratt held in BC, which was indicating that this is a, now a, a free speech free zone, if you will. In other words, your constitutional rights are prohibited, not even expressing a, a view on the topic of abortion, but he was charged those, there are some cases now in Ontario regarding that. So 
in Canadian law, what we've seen is some incredibly broad prohibitions imposed on not only the right of, of pro-life individuals to express their concern about abortion, but also their care for the women who are in these situations within a certain sphere, generally now 50 meters around abortion clinics in Canada, in, in, mil, in many provinces. But we're also seeing that when it comes to the case law, um, it's, it's almost been universally upheld. Uh, I should go back, however, and discuss just a little detail that we find in the case of Dealman. And this is the 1994 case that comes out of Ontario. And, and this is where uh, the court uh, there was concerned about these loud and, and, and aggressive protests where they're you know, arguing against women for killing their babies, where they're trying to obstruct entrance to abortion clinics. Uh, and it was interesting in that particular case that the court uh, noted those individuals to whom the bubble zone would not apply. And, and this is where you begin to see the realm in which Canadian courts may be willing to recognize a continued existence of constitutional rights, even if they've essentially eviscerated them for many protesters. And, and I just wanna read you a, a brief paragraph. And, and here's Justice Adams talking about an individual. He says, specifically, this order does not enjoin the defendant Umbertino or her regular associates from conducting herself as she has in the past. Any restrictions on how she presently conducts herself does not pass the minimal impairment test of Oaks. And this is the test in which individuals uh, can say, my charter rights are being impaired by a government law and they're not minimally impairing. In other words, if you wanna deal with violence and, and aggressive action of protesters, go ahead and deal with that. You're not minimally impairing my charter rights in this case. And this is what her, her evidence was. She does not speak to patients and staff. She does not remain in front of the Choice and Health Center. Her attendance is once a month. Uh, the defendant, Jane Ubertino, who is sometimes accompanied by two or three other women, walks up and down the sidewalk meditatively praying and sometimes hands out pamphlets. This occurs on the last Friday of each month for one hour. No women or clinic staff have ever been prevented from entering the clinic over the past three years because of the presence of these picketers. And so the court specifically excluded from its prohibition on, on people in the bubble zone, this particular activity and this particular women. Now, what we've seen is that laws as written do prohibit that kind of activity, but the original prohibition in the Dealman case uh, did not prohibit that kind of activity. And in fact, uh, Mrs. Gibbons, uh, I believe has engaged in substantially that kind of activity and has spent a dozen years in prison. But that is the kind of circumstance uh, that there was an indication from the court, at least initially, that that would not be um, uh, uh, prohibited by the injunction. And I should, should note that the court was also aware of, okay, there, there's the desire of protesters to express their disapproval on abortion. And they are wanting to do that right at an abortion clinic. Um, of course, laws concerning abortion have been failed to be made, I should say, by the legislatures in Canada. And abortion clinics are simply acting in those voids. Um, but the court, however, was also concerned about the rights of patients. And, and so uh, Justice Adams, and again, going all the way back to the Dealman case, noted that this hypothetical patient, in any event, will be able to see protesters within, and in his view, the immediate vicinity. His bubble zone was only 20 meters wide. So he said the, the patient could see the protesters within the immediate vicinity of the locations, including across the street. And if she wishes to receive a pamphlet or have extended verbal contact with the protesters, this will clearly be open to her. And so again, you see the court recognizing that the right of women attending abortion clinics to receive information should not be uh, overlooked. And I think that is an incredibly important reality in Canada that we often overlook. We say, well, here's an unpopular view or these people wanna provide information about abortion, but what if someone wants to receive it? What if someone needs to receive that information? What if someone's only receiving one side of the story? What if this is an abortion being pushed upon someone 
because they don't have access to the finances or the support or, or just the caring uh, fellowship of another person willing to walk with them through whatever circumstance they're going through. And, and so you see that there was a willingness of the court to recognize the existence of that possibility and, and even in Canada, an exclusion from bubble zones, at least initially of that kind of activity. Again, statutes uh, other than in BC have not been challenged. And in BC, we, we weren't, they weren't being challenged by, by an individual in such manner. They were being challenged by, by men, frankly, walking up and down a sidewalk in front of an abortion clinic, holding signs. Um, which is quite distinct from the, the concern that the court was right, referencing in Beelman. I do wanna reference some United States constitutional law. It's relevant because uh, as, as a, another country which recognizes freedoms as, as we do, uh, they generally seem to have more robust freedom for freedom of expression, but certainly deal with similar issues. Um, the, the case of Hill v. Colorado uh, kind of is the leading case on this. And in that case, uh, a statute imposing a hundred foot bubble zone, but it with a floating eight foot uh, bubble around a patient heading to an abortion clinic. And within that eight feet, you could not follow a patient and seek to engage them in unconsented conversation. But that didn't prevent you from standing within that hundred feet and simply offering a conversation or offering a handbill as people passed. So you couldn't essentially walk alongside someone and try to you know, uh, engage them or, or as some of the court uh, characterized it, harass them as they went in, but you could uh, stand there and uh, offer conversation or offer literature to those that passed you. Obviously obstruction uh, was not permitted either. Um, and so the, the court in, in that case found that kind of bubble zone to be permitted. It, although it was, you know, it did make it more difficult to give unwanted advice, particularly in the form of a handle or leaflet. Uh, it was noted that um, it does not require a standing speaker to move away from anyone passing by. And so that was the, the context in which the Supreme Court in 2000 uh, permitted a bubble zone to be upheld. And then I want to go on to the case of McCullen v. Massachusetts. And this was a case brought by, I believe, the Alliance Defending Freedom, which is a, a large uh, Christian organization in the United States that is concerned with the constitutional rights of, of individuals. And uh, this case, the primary and lead petitioner was one Eleanor McClellan. And you can put her picture up there on the screen. Uh, Ms. McClellan uh, stood on the sidewalk outside the Boston Planned Parenthood facility and tried to persuade mothers not to abort their babies. And so, as you can she see, she's a very intimidating, aggressive looking individual. Um, and uh, of course not. Uh, I, and the, the reality of this woman's approach had a massive sway, I believe, on the court in the United States. The statute in Massachusetts made it a crime to knowingly stand on a public way or sidewalk within 35 feet of the entrance to an abortion facility. And I, no, we're not talking about 50 meters here, we're talking about 35 feet. Um, this is the evidence of Ms. McCullen, though. For instance, uh, she was uh, not there as. Uh, an aggressive protester to express moral or religious opposition to abortion through signs or chants, um, or in some cases, face-to-face -face confrontation. That's what the Supreme Court of the United States contrasted her with. She says, this is not that kind of person. Rather, uh, the petitioners take a different tact, the Supreme Court said. They attempt to engage women approaching clinics in what they call sidewalk counseling which involves offering information about alternatives to abortion and helping pursue those other options. And so you can see here's Chief Justice Roberts who from a principled constitutional perspective in the United States has been a, a significant disappointment. But in this case, he was swayed 
by the evidence of Eleanor McCollin. And the petitioner, for instance, will typically initiate a conversation this way. Good morning. May I give you my literature? Is there anything I can do for you? I'm available if you have any questions. And if the woman seems receptive, McCullen will provide additional information. McCullen and other petitioners consider it essential to maintain a caring demeanor, a calm tone of voice, and direct on eye contact during these exchanges. Such interactions, petitioners believe, are a much more effective means of dissuading women from having abortions than confrontational methods such as shouting or brandishing signs which in petitioner's view tend only to antagonize their intended audience. In unrefuted testimony, petitioners say they have collectively persuaded hundreds of women to forego abortions. And so the fact that these 35 foot bubble zones around abortion clinics in Massachusetts compromise these petitioners ability to initiate those close personal conversations that they viewed as essential to side guat counseling um, led the court to strike down this bubble zone law. The court specifically said these petitioners are not protesters. They are not merely there to seek to express their opposition to abortion, but rather to inform women of various alternatives and to help in uh, help them in pursuing those other alternatives. And so the the reality is is in canada we have not seen this kind of case come to the court what we have seen and you can just take the 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 powerpoint off there thank you francis um what you have seen in canada are are places where people walking with with large signs on a sidewalk have been ticketed we've seen cases where uh others again with other signs have been ticketed under or arrested even under some of these uh, injunctions. But to have a case where an individual is there seeking to uh, offer these kinds of conversations and is willing to give evidence as to their purpose, they're not there to protest, they're there, there to offer to inform these women of options and make sure that they have the information necessary uh, for them to make these choices. Um, incredibly in, impactful choices, might we add. Uh, but from a legal perspective, uh, to see that women are being informed in a caring, kind demeanor by non-confrontational, uh, non-intimidating persons, that in my submission is a case that has not been brought to the court in Canada. When it was brought to the court in the United States, uh, we saw a court that in many ways was not as not very open to constitutional rights. In fact, a uni unanimous decision, I might add, by the United States Supreme Court in favor of striking down that law on behalf of Eleanor McCullen and her fellow petitioners. And I think that that helps us to understand the concerns of a of a secular society, the concerns of a judiciary which in many ways has ignored the, the fundamental rights of expression for those who espouse unpopular views, but is still potentially alive to the reality that individuals from across the perspective of different opinions still have a right to be informed of their options, still have a right to receive potential care and concern from well-meaning and obviously um, caring individuals. And so I guess as we kind of conclude this initial discussion on bubble zones, I, I bring this to you not as an activist, not as a, a strategist, but simply as a constitutional lawyer uh, whose goal is to protect the rights of all Canadians to express their views and to receive the expression of others' views as well. And so when you're talking about uh, bubble zones in Canada it, it, around abortion clinics or hospitals, is that the place to engage in protests to change laws? From, from a legal perspective, you could 
protest probably anywhere else in society more successfully and more freely than around a bubble than around an abortion clinic or around a hospital. And there, there may be there may be good cause for that. Uh, in my view, protesting in front of parliament, protesting in front of a legislature in order for the enactment or the change of a law is entirely the appropriate location. Um, although, as you've probably noted, our recent federal government has failed to realize even that foundational fundamental freedom. Um, but when it comes to the kind of caring conversations, the informative conversations, the expressions of, of, of love and care and information that that people need uh, that really meets individuals in the circumstances in which they're at. Uh, if they're on their way to an abortion clinic and, and someone engages in a conversation like, like the petitioner McClellan engaged in with that, good morning, here's, is there anything you need? Uh, those are the kinds of conversations that from a constitutional perspective have the greatest chance of being found not simply uh, beneficial, but actually constitutionally protected in Canada. Um, we have not yet seen that go to court. Uh, but again, when we're talking uh, in Saskatchewan, you're, you're engaged right now for some strange reason that has nothing to do with the facts on the ground, but you're engaged right now with government actors trying to impose these bubble zones that would exclude any of that kind of conversation from happening around a medical facility. Uh, that is a huge concern. It shows you the state of our politics. It shows you why you need to be engaged. And it also, I hope this conversation uh, shows you the way in which you can communicate how that violation present in a law that prohibits anyone from even informing another in relation to abortion, even giving information, how that could land, even with those who may not uh, realize the inherent value of human life, um, when they see that these kinds of laws prohibit women from receiving the information uh, and support that would otherwise be available to them. Uh, again, <laughs> In the context in which we're dealing with in 2022, we're not dealing with abortion doctors being shot. Uh, we're not dealing with abusive and obstructive protests of abortion clinics on a daily basis. Uh, what we're dealing with is the attempt and the persistent unmitigated fear of anyone spreading false information to have the truth get out. And that is something that cannot be and must not be permitted to stop the fundamental freedoms of expression of peaceful assembly and association in this country or in your province. And so I think you can stand firmly on this ground in supporting not only the right of individuals to express their care, but also the right of women to receive the care of others, even in those sensitive areas uh, in front of hospitals or in front of abortion clinics. Um, and do that with full knowledge that you are standing not simply for your own rights, but standing for the rights of all uh, Canadians and, of course, the, the rights of unborn babies. And so yeah. um, with that, I would uh, then turn it back over to you, Francis, and, and be happy to take the questions that you would have. Marty, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Bridget's saying she loves that approach. Um, I... Uh... I wanted to inform you that when we, we, I asked a few questions of various ministers through a letter about the bubble zones and the response we got to a question, whether the hospital staff, the doctors, nurses, other staff could protest outside a hospital with the same issues. And the minister said, no, they could only be um, employment picketing. Uh, like, um, I don't know the actual term. So I was really shocked by that, right? So there's a lack of access of information. I really like how you phrased it. Maybe you can correct me if I get it wrong, but it's like, we have the right to express our care um, for, for people too. So, and well, I mean, the reality is, is that anywhere on a public sidewalk in Canada in any, any, any reasonable conception of freedom, you have the right to peacefully express your opinion. Of course, you don't have the right to interfere with someone else's peaceful movement down that sidewalk. I remember once being in New York City and in Times Square, and I was 
attempting to go to a store and a member holding a protest knocked me right onto my back because I, I was on the sidewalk and, and he decided that he was protesting there. And of course, that's the unconstitutional kind of, si- of yeah. protest. But you, in a, in a free society, you're allowed to protest on a sidewalk. Uh, currently in Canada, that right has been restricted severely in regard to abortion clinics and bubble zones. But where, where we see the light through which uh, the closed mindedness of some can see the value of freedom is that realm in which you're able to express care and another person is able to uh, receive that care, or if they choose not to, just simply pass on by. Um, That is the realm in which you can see the potential for uh, some constitutional realignment in regard to freedom of expression on sidewalks. Um, If anyone has uh, questions in the chat, just capital Q makes it easier to find. Um, I... It's really looking at the timeline is very important. Like I, I, I didn't grow up with the context of the more maybe vitriolic responses to abortion clinics and stuff. So um, I think I think as you're saying, it's not relevant in the context today. But when I talk to people, maybe there is some of that. Um, just like with the population boom that that um, Stephen was mentioning, that was in the common parlance. It's not a relevant thing to be discussing now. I'd like to make a qu- question while, while um, uh, I, I'd like to make a correction while questions are compiled here. Um, I mentioned that the population of the earth was 500 million 2000 years ago. It was actually 500 years ago, between 500 and 400 years ago. Uh, it was more like 200 million around uh, Christ's time. Um, but apart from that, I remember in Ottawa, this was before the 2017 case, I was there for the 40 days for life just for an hour. And there was a gentleman called Sai, I think that was his name. And he had been out there ever since he retired every day, every working day for eight hours with a sign outside a clinic in downtown Ottawa. And I, I wonder where he is now after that law. I, you know, this was in 2015, 16, and now the law in 2017. I wonder how that gentleman's doing now. So, um, I have a question for myself. You mentioned the uh, the twenty meter law as opposed to the fifty, or like across the sidewalk, as being clearly just there if, if present if the if the patient or the person seeking the abortion clinic wanted to talk. Is it helpful to mention this at all to politicians in in Saskatchewan, or is it taking away from the punch that no, the constitution? protects our speech the speech to hear and the speech to 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 give like is it worth mentioning at all when we're writing to our mlas and stuff like that well i i think i think that the fact that uh you know if you push someone 50 meters away expandable up to 150 meters yeah. away, uh, you prohibit any possibility that a person desiring to have a conversation with someone else could do so in, in any reasonable fashion. And so uh, regardless of whether it's, you know, on the other side of the street or, you know, on the other block, those are simply degrees to which you're interfering with constitutionally protected conversations. And, and if you want to, to prohibit uh, and target some, some concern with obstruction of people accessing or walking past uh, uh, you know, others protesting on the street. That's, that's a different concern to address. And it doesn't need to take the form of, of essentially what, what the Supreme Court in the United States struck down in the McCullen case where they said 35 feet. Now that's, that's not across the street in many cases. Yeah. That's, that's, that's simply on the same sidewalk. Yeah. But they struck that down saying, no, no, you, you should be able to stand there. And, and the, what the United States constitution or oh, you know, interpretation has permitted is you can stand there, you can be there present for conversations if the person desires, you can't force conversations on someone who doesn't want to have them. Um, and so, again, I am not aware of any groups that are taking an active approach to harass, to threaten, yeah. to block the yeah. access of people to walk down a sidewalk in Canada. If that's the case, they should present that as the pressing and substantial objective to which they're trying to accomplish in prohibiting constitutional protected gathering and speech. Otherwise, um, what you have is simply a government engaging at the behest of an ideologically motivated group to prohibit the expression of other views on that topic. And that's exactly what these bubble zones are. And that should be opposed 
uh, across the board without mitigation, uh, because that is anathema to a free society. And that's anathema to an individual yeah. in own pursuit of truth. And again, right down to the practical level, the ability of vulnerable people to receive the care and support financially, emotionally, even spiritually, that they probably so desperately need and desire themselves. If you prohibit the access of, of people to others, you're prohibiting their rights, as well as the rights of those who, who, who may oppose a, the, the, the choice to terminate a pregnancy. Yeah. Yeah. It's totalitarian in a, in a way, at least from how I see it. Um, there's a comment here from Florence. Good afternoon, Florence. Um, a concern now, how long before this bubble zone is extended to the web, to the internet? Um, right. Yeah. Well, we, we've seen, we've seen in Canada that, that by permitting restrictions on expression, the government does not become satisfied because a government that is, is, is happy to violate the rights and the beliefs of their ideological opponents uh, is never going to be satisfied until they actually have total control. Uh, you can't help but, but, but see the exposure of tyrannical and totalitarian tendencies when freedom of expression is allowed about what the government is actually doing or not doing. Yeah. And uh, so a totalitarian government must always double down in their uh, attack on freedom of expression. Otherwise, populations will see what the problem is and exercise their uh, democratic abilities to get them out of power. Yeah. Um, so I have a final question and also request. Um, how best can we, like, you know, we've called for people to, you know, message their MLAs, petition their local ones, the ones that are more in the ministerial positions that are, are relevant to the issues that are coming up. From your experience, I know you're a lawyer and there's, um, but I know you, you probably are aware of a lot more of what the happenings than maybe I am, but what's the best ways we can make our voices heard to our politicians? And how best can our members support JCCF in their, in yourself and JCCF in their role in Canada? Well, I think I think fundamentally in in Saskatchewan, for 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 any member of the legislature, they they need to be informed about these bubble zones as much as you are informed about these bubble zones. They need to recognize the care that the pro life community has for the women experiencing uh, the pressure to get an abortion and how they want to express that care for those women and offer those resources for women. Uh, of course, it's very difficult to, to know how to, to put that across in, in many fashions. I've seen advertisements on, on buses. I've seen advertisements on the sea train in Calgary, for example. Um, yeah. But, but that, that the care that the pro-life community has for women in these situations need to be expressed. The, the reality in which abortion, uh, these bubble zones were adopted in the face of violence and, and obstructive protests, yeah. uh, that doesn't exist. And so yeah. a question to a legislator saying, why are you being asked to adopt this? Um, I will be fr frank, I am many times uh, very dismayed at the lack of understanding that our elected members of the legislature have, even when they go in to vote on different issues. And so they need to be aware of what yep. the bill actually says. You can reference media all the time. Media has no integrity when they're reporting on what legislation actually says. You need to not even assume that your elected representatives have, have even read the bills before them. Yep. And so take a look at the bill yourself, show them how broad the proposed language is and why that would prohibit not only your ability to express care, but the ability of others to receive those expressions of care. Um, and of course, you can remind them of the charter, uh, the, the language of, of rights and freedoms is, all, is often been toxic, but so we often need to, to be able to explain it into a, a way that, that has tangible impact for people. If someone is prohibited from receiving information, you are depriving them of their ability to get care, to get financial assistance, to get emotional support maybe even to be extricated from an abusive situation. Think Absolutely. of why, of how the expression that you are prohibiting can cause lasting damage 
not simply from 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 the value of human life, but from the in, impact on an individual's life who you are ostensibly uh, seeking to protect from yeah. knowledge and care. And so, again, be creative in the sense of of not just asserting rights and and freedoms, but asserting the impact and how prohibiting your rights yeah. and freedoms impacts, in fact, the rights and freedoms of others. There's a, there's a um intersection of concerns that we that hopefully can be can be used in in communicating and writing um, writing to the media as well uh writing letters expressing like here's my views this is what the law actually says this is the harm the law will actually do so that members of the public who may or may not agree with you on various issues can see uh how the restriction of freedom can can harm uh things that they care about as well um, in regard to the Justice Center, uh, of course, we're, we provide advice to, to many different groups. Uh, pro-life groups are often targeted. Uh, yeah. We operate fully pro bono. We have a network of lawyers. We've hired lawyers in Saskatchewan, so I'm not the only guy that, that shows up in Saskatchewan anymore. And we're a registered charity, and you can uh, find us on the web at jccf.ca. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today, Marty. You're a very busy man, and so we are super grateful the president was really grateful that you made time for us. So can everyone give a very warm thank you in the chat for Marty?